Okay, a transporter, supposedly, they could draw the energy from some sort of mythical slash mystical uh, warp drive drive. engine or something, right? And so that was something that you could do person to person. A wormhole requires something much more supernatural, more powerful. A black hole, for example, or some sort of mystical creature, uh, someone who could master magic and dimensional travel. So in that sense, the wormhole strategy is less likely to be our strategy than a warp drive type strategy, where we can somehow move faster than the speed of light through space, through our controlled engines. So do we borrow this energy from another dimension? Ooh, good question. Yeah, because how much energy, because if this is like the galaxy right. and you warp it, right, and then you travel through the little bridge the and the warp app, and you unwarp right. mm-hmm. then you can cross the galaxy during the tv commercial that's and right and then you can make it right yeah the problem is you would have to, in that scenario you are warping space that's a lot harder than warping ourselves so you're that's, warping the entire universe, galaxy right the whole galaxy that's what a wormhole would have to do yeah you see okay so got it What happens is with warp drive, this is all sort of retroactively created after the television show, right, was so successful. The idea is that you put the Enterprise or your spaceship of choice into a little bubble that is outside the regular space time that we live in. But it's inside in a little pocket, right? So it's almost in its own extra dimensional travel. And what happens is that bubble can move faster than the speed of light, even though you yourself cannot. So while you're in the bubble, that's when your warp drive is working. It's not warping space. It's warping you into, out of, through, and otherwise bubbly, bubbly, bubbly in space. Which would take much much less energy than folding the whole universe around you. In fact, a Mexican uh, physicist named Miguel Acubiere used Einstein's general theory of relativity and actually came up with some mathematical equations that could make a warp bubble like that exist. So mathematically, you could do it. The problem is, once you've made the bubble, how do you move that move thing the so bubble fast? Itself, right. And we still don't have anywhere near the technology to be able to do that. Okay. And what do you do with it once you've got it? You go through space time at but faster than Once you've done light. that, once you've what, made the bubble, yeah, and you've traveled, then, right. then what happens? What to you the have bubble? to do is literally warp the bubble in such a shape that the space behind it is changing at a faster rate than the space in front of it. And that's how you get it to move through space. You keep warping in this sort of continuous way so that the warp pushes you forward through space. That's not what he asked. How do you get out of the bubble? Yeah. Once you, you get to once, your destination, once you, you, get, you pop it. <laughs> There's my Done. answer. Okay. Quite, quite <laughs> literally, your dilithium crystals in Star Trek, right? Your dilithium crystals just shut off, and then the bubble just evaporates around you. Oh, okay. It's good. So I, I have this dream of the future where wormholes, because you, now you're putting k- k- kibosh on it, wormholes are how we get around, which mm-hmm. means no one needs roads. Not only that, your back of your refrigerator could be connected via a wormhole to your grocer. And they pop it open. Oh, the milk is, and they put in fresh milk and eggs, and you just have you just have a contract to have that loaded. And there's no truck. There's no. It would put Amazon out of business. Right. Well, the trucks would the drivers. If we could move wormholes, one end here, the other end there, and just move them around at will, mm. then your scenario is completely likely. The problem is, it takes so much energy even to create a wormhole with two stable locations that even if it were physically possible, which we don't know yet, mm. when that happens, it's station to station. Yeah, it's but if we told the Wright brothers, one day we're going to fly 400 people at 600 miles an hour across the ocean, they so that takes too much energy. Oh, yeah, that's too much energy. Are you kidding that's me? Right. So, we're flying a bicycle right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so that so is Charles, the challenge. Wh- where is your sense of time perspective in that declaration that you're making? I would say that sometime within our lifetimes, we will be able to generate something that we have tried to do since the end of World War II, and that is controlled nuclear fusion. Whoa. We will. At the moment, there is some technology that's happening being developed all over the world, including in France at a uh, site called... Charles, that's a low bar. I'm talking about like the future. Well, but wait a minute. I don't know if that's a low bar because when you think about it, what we're talking about here is the need for massive amounts of energy. So if we're able to control fusion, which, I mean, we know what kind of energy is packed in the no, I get it. I'm just saying, 
we should have had fusion decades ago when we yes. have, we're not there yet. That's right. So I don't want that to be the, I want that to be a given and now give me like extra cool stuff. Okay. That's all. Solar power. So, 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 so now, but let me, let me just shape the conversation a little differently. Okay. So we're talking about warping space. All right. There's another feature that we've seen in different films uh, and that's becoming invisible. Mm. Not disappearing, right? but just... No, that's a different thing. That's I, something different. I know how you do that. Get older. <laughs> <laughs> and then try to talk to young people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. Invisibility so, played so, a very so, prominent role in uh, Fantastic Four, the most recent yeah. superhero movie. Yeah, yeah. Featuring the invisible girl, and, now and invisible woman. And there's the invisibility cloak in... Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. Harry Potter. You got Star Trek, the Romulan oh, the device. 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 Yes. device. Yes. Right, right. So, um, and, and, oh, also in the original Predator movie. Oh yeah. He had he could go he could go invisible, but in all those cases there was a little bit of little j jittery, a shimmering, shimmering, shimmery thing, th like silhouette. Yeah, exactly. A see-through shimmering silhouette. So I'll tell you what I know about this, and I, Charles, you might know more that there is work on this. It is real. Uh, in fact, in the, there's a James Bond, I forgot which one, is it Quantum of Solace? One, one of those where his Aston Martin has an invisibility button and he presses it and it just becomes invisible, but it shimmers into invisibility, of course. You can still shoot it, you just can't see it, okay? So you don't know where to aim. And so there is research now, uh, because what does it mean to be invisible? It means light from behind you continues to your sight line as though you're not there. So, so what you do is instead of blocking the light, they have a series of reflectors that coherently moves the light around your body and then sends it forward as though it didn't take this detour. And you're sitting on the other side of me, you just see the wall behind me and you don't even know that I'm there. Hi. The, 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 there, there are demos of this online. There are YouTube videos. You can see this. Authentic. It's not AI fake. The problem is now it works only if you're exactly aligned with it. If you go offline, oh. then, it, then it, the, the effect collapses. So, but it, that's a start. And you're functionally invisible when you can pull that off. Marvelous. Yeah. I was not aware of the technology. But there's, there's different point. types of invisibility. Yeah. If you look at a, a stealth bomber. For yes, instance, right. It's oh, invisible on the right, but that's only in that particular area. Very important fact. So the stealth bomber has a radar cross section of a bumblebee. Mm. Okay, so that's a if, dangerous bumblebee right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. imagine that radar like a hell okay. of a sting. So if you are trying to detect planes with radar, so just just at the risk of stating the obvious, the radar hits your your intended object, and it reflects back to you in the shape of what the thing is. And you can look at the blip, and if it's got any kind of detail, and you put some AI on it, it'll tell you what the plane is. Mm -hmm. The stealth bomber is designed very specially so that any incident radar reflects in a different direction than straight back. Wow. Okay? And can we get a version for this for um, speed traps? Because... Oh. <laughs> yeah, because to, to try to send it, then it doesn't go back. It doesn't go back. It'll whiz by, and it'll just say there's nothing there. Exactly. Right. So, so if you look at how the, the surfaces of the stealth bomber and other stealth technologies are shaped, take a line and hit it, and it'll never send you back in the direction you came on any surface. Okay. So it's all faceted. And yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And just a side fact, um, the earliest of the stealth bombers, I think it was the F-117, used now decades ago, had a flat surfaces on it. Okay? Take a look at a fascinating history of this. You know why it had flat surfaces? Because the computers were not powerful enough mm. to perfectly solve the equation to have a continuously curving surface. So it had to approximate it with flat surfaces. So that still reduced the radar cross-section, but it didn't take it to as low as the bumblebee. Once we could fit it with high-performance computing, you can curve the, sh the surfaces so that hardly any signal goes back. So here's the problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly your point. 
its radar cross-section is a bumblebee. But if you just step out and look up, there it is, okay? <laughs> its optical cross-section is the full plane, okay? So where you are in the electromagnetic spectrum exactly. matters here. Totally. Right. Yeah. Well, invisibility isn't all that great of a superpower by itself. Let's face it. Okay. If you can just hide, that's great. But you got to do something other than hide, right? And so, in fact, with the superheroine, the invisible woman, the Marvel comics back in the 60s developed an extra power for her. Not only did she have the ability to turn invisible, she also could project invisible force fields. She could actually do things invisibly to you without even touching you. All she had to do was to envision a shape of something made of force that was invisible and then be able to lift you up as if you were sitting in a chair or to move you around or to push you back. It had the ability to protect and be invisible at the same time. So that's effective even if the force is not invisible. That's right. right? Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a field around you. Right. You can do that. Now, we know in quantum physics, there's, a, there's an effect. Quantum is spooky, weird stuff. It's, <laughs> and that's why everyone, it attracts people because they want to understand it. And quantum physics is not there to understand. <laughs> it's, Charles, go, correct me if I'm wrong. You, no one comes out of a quantum physics class and oh, I understand that. No, you don't, okay? <laughs> it is just what the universe does. <laughs> On the small scales, we can describe it, we can calculate, but we scratch our heads every single time. And one of the effects, fascinatingly, is if you take two very smooth, very flat metal plates and evacuate the space between them, so it's a vacuum, you start making them closer and closer to each other. There is a point where there's a whole new force that pulls them together. It's not electromagnetic, it's not gravitational, it's not the strong nuclear force, it's some new thing. Maybe they just really like each other. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> they pull each other together. And that, that discovery won a Nobel Prize. And so, so the Casimir effect. Yes, the Casimir, Casimir effect. effect. So, sure. That's a Casimir force. The, the Casimir force. So what? Yes. Is, tell us. Oh, what, what causes that? The Casimir effect is caused because there are things called quantum fluctuations in our universe. Even when things have apparently no energy or no change at all, at the quantum level, levels far smaller than atoms with energies far tinier than a single, say, electrical pulse, there is a little bit of this happening all the time all around you. So if you are getting a smaller and smaller space between these two plates, you get to a small enough point where the quantum fluctuations are actually bouncing off of those plates. And so you create an attractive or sometimes a repulsive force okay. that kicks in only just before they touch because the quantum effects, small as they are, are definitely there. And so you can imagine actually influencing something without actually pushing on it or pulling on it. It's actually just the quantum work that's being done because the universe is shimmering you have to, on you that have tiny to get level. Really, really close. Super close. Mm. So, so I'm a villain, just yes. your average villain, but oh. I want to upgrade to super villain. Ooh. How am I using the Casimir effect? The Casimir effect. Yeah. Oh. Am I, oh, is, it, is it like, yeah, I'm going to do stuff. <laughs> yes, play? that's a great point. If you somehow were a superhero or a supervillain yes. that could take advantage of quantum fluctuations, you might be able to say, I hereby declare that the quantum fluctuations in this part of the universe are going to be reduced. In exchange, the puns in this part are going to be increased. All of a sudden, you have all this extra energy over here and much less over there. So you could imagine something literally being sucked from here to there due to quantum effects alone. Because the object naturally wants to go so, from high energy to low energy. That's right. right so okay. you could move something without doing anything other than just changing the quantum fluctuation. So you're creating a gradient. You're creating that gradient. Yeah. And the problem, of course, is that this is a much larger space than the quantum fluctuation space is. Anytime you have a quantum fluctuation, we're talking things that are billionths of billionths of inches, right? Going from this part of the room to that part of the room. If you wanted to carry me from here to there, that's many, 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 many billionths of inches. So that's by the it. time that happens, I think we're all going home. Yeah. So there's, there's a... <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> there's a physicist. 
uh, George Gamow. Ah. He's a hero of mine because he was an active physicist and he wrote for the public. And, and he was one of the first people who hypothesized the hot Big Bang theory. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so he had a series of books called Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland. And each book, it's, it's fanciful and he illustrated it with cartoon illustrations. Each book was you living in a world where the universal constants have different values. Oh. So for example, instead of the speed of light being as fast as it is, speed of light is 60 miles an hour. Oh, wow. So you drive down the street, he, he's describing this. Yeah. And as you go to 30 miles an hour, four, he's describing how all your scenery changes. And so it was such a world to jump into, which has me wonder if you had real power over the universe and you could adjust the value of the physical constants that control quantum physics, maybe you could dial that up so that we respond to quantum physics in the way particles do. Yes. There is an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called Q Who, where this exactly happened. Really? Yes. The great creature named Q, who was being punished by his other fellow Qs, had been power As school. one would happen. Yes, yeah. right, because he was being too <laughs> mischievous. So what happened was that they were having a, a problem on a planet and trying to solve that problem, and they couldn't figure it out. And so they asked Q, said, what would you do? He's like, oh, it's obvious. Change the gravitational constant of the universe. And all the rest of the humans are like, we can't do that. Uh, but the engineer, Jordy LaForge, said, hey, maybe we could, right? That's the superhero you're talking about. Somebody yeah. who could actually change the gravitational constant of the universe, and boom, suddenly your planet is as light as a feather. Yeah. Just because you change the force Just of gravity. Just because you change force of gravity in that location. That's a badass power right Incredible. there. Incredible. Yeah, you're thinking yeah. like yeah. a supervillain now. No, I'm not. <laughs> Stop. Don't bring me into your category. <laughs> so what intrigues me about... Uh, I think most about what has happened in this in this world is there's some writers who no 